What is method writing? Oh, you're starting off with a hard question. <laughs> well, I, I'm an actor, and method acting is a, f a big school of acting that Marlon Brando and people like that studied under, Marilyn Monroe and so forth. And uh, I studied method acting, and it stresses um, an authentic uh, response to what your work is. You're not acting with gestures. You're, you're being true. You're being natural. And uh, I was teaching writing in which I thought I wanted writers not to worry about the technique or the style uh, to begin with, but to get in touch with their, their center, their, their true voice. So I called it method writing, like method acting, method writing. And that was the basic idea. Uh, method writing is a much more complicated methodology of learning to write from your deep truth. And there are a lot of other techniques I teach that are about cinematic images. So in a sense, you're making a movie in the reader's head. So there's other things you have to know how to do. But the core of it, just like with acting, is to be centered and to be true. So method writing is references method acting. How easy is that for someone? Does, does it, do we think that we're being true and in actuality we're actually putting on airs and the audience can see that and they can see it in our writing? Well, if it was easy to do that, there would be no, uh, everybody would be acting. It's not easy to do that. That's why people take acting classes. Uh, I always ask people, what do you learn? What's the first thing you learn to do in an acting class? And the answer is how not to act, how not to look like you're acting. Because uh, if you've ever been to a play, there's always some, some guy that's overacting, and you sense it right away. And as soon as you see the, ca the person acting, you're pulled back from the reality of the play. Now, of course, the play's not real. You know it's a play. But while you're watching it, you want to have the feeling that it's real. Matter of fact, they instead of saying you believe it, the theater expression is you suspend your disbelief. Because you know it's not Hamlet. You know, you, you know these are actors. But what you, what you want to create is the feeling of verisimilitude, truth, so that the people in the audience for that hour and a half, two hours, can suspend their disbelief and fall into it. Well, if you have an actor overacting, uh, you know right away that they're an actor and you can't get into it. Um, that's why people study acting, to learn how not to act, to learn how to be natural, because it's very easy to be natural in your home when you're sitting there smoking a cigar and drinking a beer. But let's say you be natural on a stage with 500 people out there and, you know, lights hitting you from above. Or in a movie where there's a, you know, a camera looking right at your eye and there's the guy with the sound boom and, you know, 20 people around you. Let's see you relax and be real in that situation. And that takes training. Now, when you get to writing... People don't realize when they're not writing authentically because they, they learn to sound like writers. They learn to be poetic. They learn to be eloquent. And they develop a lot of bad habits in the attempt to look like they're writers, quote unquote. So it's very hard to get people to write in an authentic way. It, it's hard to get people to act in an authentic way, but harder to get them to write in an authentic way because they really don't believe that they are not writing in a natural voice. They, they, they have all this fancy junk that they write, but they think it's, oh, it's, I'm a writer. Look at me, Ma. But very hard to do that. To get to your natural, what I call the deep voice, uh, that takes focus and it takes practice and training, just like an athlete. You know, an athlete's got to be able to perform with a lot of pressure and act like there's no no pressure. You know, you can't choke. So it's the same with writing. You you're doing something that's unnatural. You know, you're right. If I were writing a shopping list, I wouldn't be uptight. But all of a sudden, I'm writing my great American novel or my great poem, 
And, you know, I'm, I'm suddenly going to be, oh, I'm a poet, blah, blah, blah. I'm a writer, blah, blah, blah. And you start to push. So it's very hard to let go of that and just be real and be authentic. And it takes training. Is it hard to write a good story? <laughs> Is it hard to write a good story? Um, no, it's not hard to write a good story. It's hard to write a great story. And the only way you're going to write a great story is to be willing to write a shitty story. When you try to write a good story, you're in big trouble. Just like with acting. When you try to be acting, you're in trouble. So, again, you've got to be calm. You've got to be simple. And if you, if you write truly, sometimes you might write a bad story. Sometimes you might write a crappy story. But if you're always trying to write a good story, you'll never write a great story. But if you're willing to fail and write a bad story or a crappy story, once in a while you get lucky and then you get a great story. So for me, it's like going to the races. I'd rather pick a winner that's a long shot and makes a lot of money than win a lot of little races that pay only $2. So yeah. It's easy to write a good story. It's hard to write a great story. You mentioned willingness to fail. With some of your students or others that you've seen, is there something in them that they're too rigid and they can't let go of the idea of being perfect and doing everything great or excellent at first pass? Yeah. I mean, I could just quote what you just said. But you see, you've got to understand that as I said, it's very easy to be sitting home in your living room having a beer and a cigar and be natural. But let's say you be natural in front of an audience of 500 people or in front of a, the lens of a, of a camera, like in a movie, and that lens is, you know, it's right up against your face. Man, you freak out. You get nervous. You push. You, you overdo it. So when you're writing, it's, it, it's a little hard to relax and just, just be honest, be true, and get to your deep voice. I have techniques in writing for how to get to the deep voice. I have a thing called the transformation line, which is a, um, a certain kind of statement that you, uh, as I say, you massage it. It means you take it deeper and you, you go deeper and deeper into it. Um, but when you're doing that, you can't be thinking of your plot or your story. And again, everybody, when they start to write, they, they first think of a story. They think of what they're going to write about, death. If you, if you know what you're going to write about before you write about it, you're in trouble. But most people don't want to write about what they don't know they're going to write about because then it might not be good, and no one wants to take that chance. So they start out with, hmm, what can I write about? Oh, I know. I'll write about that time my... My grandfather slipped and fell off the roof into the fish pond. Yeah, that'll make a good story. And then they put a little, little start to write a good what they think is a good story. Instead of just approaching the writing from nothing, a very zen kind of an idea, you begin with nothing and see where it wants to go. Most people don't want to risk that because if you do that, you might write something bad and people don't want to fail. But if you're willing to fail, then sometimes you, you strike it rich. Can those who are worried so much about failure do exercises to lessen that, to, to make themselves feel either more at home on the stage or at home uh, bearing their words to people that might criticize them? Well, I do use the term exercises. Um, in Stanislavski, who did method acting, uh, he's got the word concepts, and uh, I also was in Second City and did improvisational theater and even taught classes in it. Uh, they use something called theater games. So if anyone ever watches that TV show, um, um, uh, what's the name of it? Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, they always have a, a little game they have to play. So you, you have these points of focus an exercise, a theater game, a concept. And you learn these concepts. And if you focus on the concept, then you're not focused on the story. So you can actually practice that. But when you say an exercise, to me, 
every time you write, you're doing an exercise. When I'm in rehearsal for a play and then opening night comes, I don't suddenly go, oh, it's opening night. I can act. What you've been rehearsing is not acting. In the whole six weeks of, or two weeks of your rehearsal, you're rehearsing to be true. So when opening night comes, you don't suddenly start acting. You are continuing to do that work. So to me, the exercise is what you do when you are writing. And if you fail, now we go into a different issue, which is an issue for a lot of people who are successful in life with anything. People who are successful in life with anything, they interpret failure differently than people who tend to be unsuccessful. When, when people tend to be unsuccessful, they interpret failure as evidence that they're not good at that. So then they try something else. Successful people, whether you're a writer or an insurance salesman or a banker or whatever, a bank robber, you know, <laughs> it applies to everything. When you have learning how to juggle, okay? I'm supposed to drop the ball a hundred times. I don't drop the ball once and twice and then I think, well, I can't juggle. I go, yeah, that's, that's what happens when you learn how to do something. You fail. So a successful person, they interpret failure as what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to fail. And then you keep doing it, and you fail some more, and you fail more. Or as Samuel Beckett said, uh, fail, um, try again, fail again, try again, fail better. In other words, I'm supposed to fail. And when I fail, it means I'm on the road toward learning how to juggle successfully. So that's the real difference. And the way to prevent failure is to always aim for good. Because ultimately, everybody can be good. But to be great means you have to risk failing. And unless you're willing to risk failing, you won't be great. So when people fail at something, they go, oh, I guess I'm not good at that. But successful people interpret failure as, yeah, I'm supposed to fail. And I'll keep failing. And eventually, I'll get better. And I'll learn how to juggle. And I'll learn how to do it. So that's the, the key. It's not about failing, it's how you interpret failure. That's the big difference.